So Shingi, thank you for your time. Um, so an introduction to you, you helped launch News UK's diversity initiative, the News Academy, while you were still a student and you were hired as the Sunday Times first apprentice in 2017. That's only three years ago now. That's crazy. Uh, a reporter since 2018, his story about children using corrosive fluid as a weapon kickstarted the paper's acid attack Britain campaign. And he specialises in writing about youth violence, social mobility and race. So thank you for your time. Did you want to um, do kind of a little intro or did you want to load up your slides or how do you want to do it? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll share slides after the first little word of introduction if you like. Um, and that was, yeah, that's, that's my Times author bio, which, you know, my career is ever shifting, but those, you know, that's the neat summary of, of how I got into this. Um, and on a base level, uh, I am a news reporter, which my job is literally to get stories into the news newspaper, into the first sort of 10, 15 pages, if you like. Um, and that might involve bringing in my own ideas from sources, contacts, or, you know, local newspapers I've read or periodicals, magazines, whatever it may be. And then the second bit of that job is breaking news chasing a live story, chasing something that may have just happened, whether that be, you know, a terror attack or a sporting event or, you know, a big political break. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty intense job, but that's the surface level, you know, that's the surface level idea. But as you can see, I do not look or, you know, sometimes sound like your traditional or what you might envisage as your traditional broadsheet newspaper reporter it's been you know a long journey which hasn't been you know straightforward it isn't like some people who might have been plucked from certain stock and then just carried on in the linear route to get into the newsroom there's no problem with that but that wasn't the way you know I'm not a child of newspapers so what I wanted to do with loading up these slides I'll just share yeah I don't know how to but yeah I'll just share some share, share some slides I wanted to kind of visually take us through my journey into the newsroom to kind of help me also touch on the themes I wanted to look at um, in this talk, which we'll be looking at sort of race in the newsroom and also some of my tips into, you know, breaking down the barriers that meant that, you know, we, where we are and technically, you know, I'm in the Sunday Times office right now, where I am doesn't quite represent the population, but I think, you know, there are tangible things we can do to get there. So um, here we are. These are, I'll, I'll, start with a, I'll start with a picture. Um, I think you can see my screen, right? Yeah. So we'll go back to the beginning. So this is where I wanted to start. Um, so my story and the thing that anchors me is my relationship with my mom. Apologies to my brother for that awful picture of him I've just used in a Zoom. Uh, but it happens. I'm sure he'd be okay with it. And I come from a single parent home. So my mom, Carol, is uh, is was born in the UK as well, but she spent most of her, her, her kind of upbringing in Zimbabwe, um, where the rest of my family are from. Um, and, you know, she, uh, she had me at the age I am now, which is 24. Um, and basically for all of, all of my life, she's been the only, you know, only parent in my home, um, along with me and my brother. And, you know, from the get go, she's instilled a kind of a love of reading, uh, which is beyond, which was often beyond our material means. I'm not saying it was abject poverty, no, it's far from it, but you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't ultra comfortable at the beginning. She would work up, you know, multiple jobs often. Um, and you know, it wasn't like you could get those trainers on demand if you wanted them type of thing. Uh, but as this picture, I think, and the reason I used it, um, kind of exemplifies again, it was just the love of learning and an idea that you can get out of your material circumstances uh, if you were bookish that she instilled in me um, and she's still a massive role model. And then the picture on my right is another big part of my upbringing. So I've only ever properly, permanently lived in one place, one borough, and that is Newham. Um, and that's a picture of Stratford Station. And it's, it's a strange one because I took, it was actually taken by me a few months ago and I didn't intend to get, the, I didn't want, in fact, I didn't want to, the, the man who's homeless, who's, who's sleeping on the street, that wasn't, I was trying to get a picture of the station sign, but in some ways it's, it's pretty indicative of the era I'm in, that he just somehow ended up in the picture 
and that's what Newham in some ways is like. It's you know, it's a to put it bluntly, it's a poor borough. Um, I think I was looking at a statistic that said children in Newham over fifty percent. Uh, grow up in households that you would categorise as poor, whereas the London average is 38%. Um, it's an area which is complex, is multicultural, but, you know, you. I, I remember being away for a little while for a reporting job and coming back and looking around and thinking, you know, this isn't an area which is, is distinctly affluent. And I think those two things will always be my anchors, even when I do eventually move out of my, parent, my parental home, which uh, hasn't happened yet, um, and you know, even as I kind of you know climb up the ladders, as, as I climb up the kind of class ladder as a person, those two things I always come back to, and those two things are my underlying why and my underlying kind of you know base level facts as a journalist. Um, and I just think you know before I even spoke, it's important to, to, to mention that those are those are that's where I'm coming from. Um, and it sort of you know that love of books that I mentioned with my mom. Uh, in my home sort of progressed. So I think by the time I was 14, uh, I knew I really liked English literature as a subject. And I also knew kind of vaguely that I wanted to be um, a journalist of sorts. I really, really liked tennis. And what I'm going to show you um, before I get back to these pictures is my first, it's hilarious, it's my first ever tennis blog, which I started when I was 14, and it is so ugly. And I think all the page views now are from me re reloading it to, to discuss in talks. But it was a living, breathing organism. I like Roger Federer, I like Nadal, and I like those guys, and I thought, I'm going to have something. So on the encouragement of my mum, I started this, and this was literally, I had nothing. I didn't know anyone in journalism. I didn't know, you know, I didn't know the industry inside out. But I had my mini tennis blog, and off I went that was that was the thing and I started talking to my English teachers and everyone at school about oh, I want to be a journalist you know I like writing I like exploring ideas I like tennis at the time I wanted to be a sports journalist so um off I went and so Shin, can I can I just stop you for a sec I'm just going to reclaim the host yes but I don't want it to I just want to let you know in case it um low, yeah. gets rid of your powerpoint so one sec no no worries okay cool yeah we're good cool I've got I'll, I'll keep on going through slides. I've got a couple more. I think. Yeah, that's thing. But um, yeah, so I think I'm about 14. I've got that hideous tennis blog and I've got lots of energy and I know I want to get into newspapers. And then I tell an English teacher, Mr. Twyman, who I'll never forget, he's a, he's a, he's a legend. Uh, he, he had found out about this program, picture which is on the bottom right, um, my right anyway, called the Young Journalist Academy, aimed at bringing state school kids into journalism. And it was like a summer school program. So I applied to that. I had a slightly updated and better looking blog, which was a general sports blog at the time. I would have been 16 or so. And uh, I got onto that scheme. And that was sort of my my first way in, my first, you know, inroads into those tangible things you need to be a journalist because it was the, the scheme was simple it was a two-week summer school in fact one week and it was just journalists coming in and giving master classes on their branch of, of journalism whether it was you know uh comment writing news reporting entertainment reporting it was just like a boot camp for people from some of the biggest kind of um outlets in the industry and that was my kind of like, wow, I can do this. Like in the CD writing competition, I had to write about this very strange piece of like half metal, half funk piece of music. And I ended up winning some free CDs. Don't know where they are now. Probably in the bin, but you know, uh, that that was like, okay. And at the end of those two weeks, I had one, my first mentor, a lady who I'll talk about a bit later, but two, an understanding of how journalism sort of kind of worked. I still hadn't properly been in a newsroom, but I was like, okay, this is a concrete idea. And these are living, breathing people who I can be like. Um, and then the picture on your left, which is, I mean, apart from the fact I'm a lot older and I still, my tie, my tie is tall. But anyway, um, I, that picture on your left is me um, launching a program called the News Academy, which was a follow-up program uh, that News UK set up, basically, but very similar to the Young Journalist Academy. Um, again, they had a summer school, which was a similar sort of boot camp experience with uh, a lot of journalists. But then also, because it was in the news building and the News UK, News UK owned the Times, the Sunday Times, the Sun, Wall Street Journal, HarperCollins Publishers. Um, when I launched that, I'll never forget i mean a lot of people in the room laughed at my jokes because they had a lot of wine but there were also a lot of pretty you know powerful people in that room i didn't know at the time i just was kind of there telling them about my tennis book and journalism but a guy came up to me when i finished speaking uh and he was 
associate editor of the Sunday Times at the time. So that's like number four of, you know, three on the paper. And he said, come and into, you know, come. And I would have been 17. Didn't, you know, really read the newspaper religiously. Um, didn't, I don't even know if I knew it was separate from the Times at the time. But he gave me that chance. Um, and then I just started interning, like, rapidly, giving it everything. That kind of, that, that new and working class um, hustle kicked in. And I remember just creating a mini rotation, if you like. So even though I went to the University of Warwick and did English, I had a great time there, did the student newspaper. I kind of knew this Sunday Times place was cool. They had seen, you know, they were keen on nurturing me. And then I just got onto as many desks and did two weeks internships as I could I did news I did the magazine I did which was paid I did I sort of did sports I did the news review section which is features but I was just in the building and as you can imagine I stuck out like a sore thumb and I also stuck out like a sore thumb more because I was always asking questions who is this person who does that how does that work you know it could even be a mundane question about the photocopier but I'm asking it you know I wanted to be there I wanted to be a journalist and I think at a point uh, when I was graduating and you go into your sort of post-degree crisis because you don't know what you want to do, particularly if you do a, a creative degree, I was like, I need to, I wanted to go to the Sunday Times, you know what I mean? So I, I did something which now I know is slightly ballsy. At the time, I was just like, this is this is what I'm going to do. But I asked the guy who was the managing editor who kind of looked after the money, if you like, and looked after kind of hires and staff and HR. Uh, but I knew him. He was one of the random people I'd asked the question in the lift once. And then from then on, I knew him. I gave him a donut when I left one internship as well. That I didn't do on purpose, but it helped. I must have. But I asked him for a job. I said, you know, I'll do anything. I'll so, uh, you know, I literally, you know, I'll I'll take anything. Just you know, I'd love to be there. And he's like, "All right, write me a cover letter." That same evening, wrote it, sent it to him, and then he took it into some of the execs at the paper, including the editor and sort of the deputy and a few higher ups who had all met me through my internships, um, and you know, realized that I was I was half decent, but I'd be taking a punt because I didn't have any formal journalism training at the time. But they said, "You know what?" were given the apprenticeship so I was the first person to be given this kind of bespoke training program which meant I would study at the place called News Associates which is the UK's number one journalism school and come into the office for a bit and when I finished I ended up in the newsroom in what would have been February 2018 um, so it was I mean now in hindsight that was like okay that was you know it was it was it was noteworthy for that to happen but I was just going 100 miles per hour and trying to, to land. Um, and I think my career, taking it back to what I said in the first slide, my career so far, and I was going to talk a bit about some of the stories I'm proudest of, but my career so far is still anchored in some of those experiences I have that are completely different from some of the other people in our newsroom, or quite frankly, most other newsrooms. Um, and some of the stories I wanted to touch on, which are, are basically a product of my experiences um, as a black working class Londoner, are these three. First one is this, which is, uh, is, is a bleak headline, but the way it came about was just, it was, uh, it was interesting. So my younger brother from slide one, uh, he's a lot, he was a lot bigger at the time, though. He, uh, while I was interning at the Sunday Times, I must have been about eight, 18, 19, uh, he told me kids are bringing Luke, what was it? Let me, let me phrase it. Let me phrase it properly. He told me that kids are bringing acids to school in Lucas Aid bottles and they call it dosing and they squirt it on each other. And I'm in the newsroom and I'm just like, I know, you know, the news editor, I know how it kind of works, but I've never pitched the story. But I'm like, this is mad. You know, I'm sitting here with nothing to do. And my brother told me this. And I think there had been an acid attack the weekend before. So I went up to the news editor and it just sounded, to me, it was like gobbledygook. It was like garble. I was just like, blah, 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 acids, dosing, da, 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 da. But he kind of caught the gist of it. And he caught how alarming it was as a trend. And also how he was also probably thinking, how the hell does this guy know this? That's not standard fare in here that people know you know, or I'm um, a couple of steps removed from people bringing, you know, corrosive substances to school in bottles. But he put it on our sort of news list. Um, and, you know, he put me on it with another reporter called Robin, who helped me usually that week. And then I just started working on it, talking to some of these kids, because they, you know, even though, even though it was a horrible and ghastly thing to be doing, I knew them. They went to my, they went to the school I went to. They knew my brother, you know. Um, and some of them were prepared to talk about what, what made them go to those lengths? What? Why were you? Why did you feel that way? You know, to to carry that to school as a weapon. And again, it was 
access that only I could have got. I remember going up the top of the road to chat to one of them with a recording device and like shorts on and Air Max 95 on and the guy was just there in his puffer jacket and he spoke to me, you know, and spoke in a way that was pretty unfettered. And that story was sort of, it set me on my way, but it also set the paper on its way to setting up a campaign around, you know, uh, banning the sale of corrosive substances to, I think it's under, it was under 16s, um, hence the Acid Attack Britain campaign. Again, when we started doing more and more stories on it, I was back in uni, but I was watching from afar like, wait, I did the first one and they're still doing this. And then funnily enough, a year later, when I was properly or a couple of years later when I was properly in the newsroom, I think in my third or fourth week, the campaign came to a head. The government and I think Amber Rudd put in place a law around corrosive substances not being allowed or you can't, you know, you, you, you risk prosecution if you sold them to minors. And my name went on that as a front page story. And it's like the culmination of a campaign I had unwittingly started based on, you know, knowledge that only I could have gleaned as someone from where I'm coming from. The second story I wanted to actually save that one the second story I wanted to talk about um, came a couple of years later. Um, it's a magazine piece, um, and that's one of the joys of writing for the Sunday Times. You can write for multiple sections, um, and you know, and have a real go at it. So this is this is a magazine piece about basically people like me. It was based on people I'd, I'd met previously down the years, um, but about young working class Black Britons who basically have two jobs. Um, it shouldn't be that way, but it is, you know, you are doing your thing, whether you're an investment banker, the, the girl pictured here or the lady pictured here, Leanne was a, was a, she's now a qualified medic at the time. She was in her last year of med school. And I spoke to also a guy who was kind of in the kind of tech world, but all of them were doing what they were doing, but also bringing other people up as they, you know, as they went along. So it would be like reading cover letters in the evening, checking CVs, mentoring younger black professionals. And it was kind of this joyous piece about an emergent black middle class for which I am a part of, you know, um, and the things that we've had to go through and the experiences we have that many other people, I guess, don't quite understand yet. Um, and again, a story, just to hammer home a point, that was based on unique experiences of my own and then also the unique experiences of other people who had shared that and just broadening it out and giving, you know, to me, it was, I know, I've known this for a couple of years, but to our readership, it was like, okay, so that's what it's like to be, you know, a black Briton from an estate in Islington who then went to Warwick, then became an investment banker. You got, you, you wear two hats, you are, you are almost two people, your corporate self, your normal self, and then you are trying to bring other people along. So, you know, that was an important piece, um, again, lodged in the experiences I've had. And then the last piece I wanted to highlight, um, which I think is the reason Jermaine contacted me, one of the reasons Jermaine contacted me and uh, was was interesting. Uh, at an interesting time was this story about uh, how I was stopped and searched for spinach in my local Asda, and it was at the kind of height of the Black Lives Matter movement and protest in the summer. Uh, and my boss kind of, I think we, it, we caught, it was later on in the week, but we cottoned on after after kind of you know seeing John Boyega's powerful words and seeing all the images that there's only one black person in the newsroom, uh, and you know, and they never forced it on me. I've never felt like I've been forced to write about race. But my boss called and said, if you would be interested in talking about your experiences and consider this is the Sunday Times, a middle class, high brow, read in front of your fireplace type newspaper. Um, but she said, you know, would you? be willing to talk about what you know what you've gone through and other people and then I kind of mentioned to her this incident in Asda which just got me vexed but like I was fine you know it, it was not, it's just the tip of the iceberg but this piece for me it was one it came at a good time because my skills had developed and I knew I could write better and I knew I was you know a more effective reporter but then two it was a chance to segue into a lot of wider issues I talked about the criminal justice system I talked about the talk you get as a black young man or woman um, in your house about some of the systematic inequalities you will just face in your life. I talked about, you know, some, I brought in anecdotes from friends who had bananas thrown at them, people followed around campus when they were at university. It was just like a chance for me to just go and explore the issue for a readership who might not have been aware, aware of it. And, you know, it's opened up so many doors for me. Um, but again, it is a testament to the importance of having a newsroom, at least one person. I want there to be more people like me, and I'll get onto that in a moment. But it was a testament to having one person who 
had lived experience who you could rely on in a week in which the biggest story in town was a set of protests for which you know large quantities of the population might not have understood um and you know i'm extremely proud of that i'm extremely proud of the other two pieces i mentioned um and again it just hammers home the point that you bring in something different to the newsroom you get something different and hopefully the results are useful but I'm done with talking about myself now because it's been about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and that's that's probably the most I can go. Um, and I also just think as a as a black man in the newsroom, you can't you can't talk about your accomplishments and how you got there without the wider context. And that wider context is uh one in which you know you are an anomaly. You shouldn't be, but you are an anomaly. Um and the next part of the talk I just wanted to sort of well basically look at and assess the situation it's been done before but i think you know we should we should do it again we should consistently do it but look at and assess the state of british media particularly kind of you know the dearth of, of black talent and black voices in british media so the next the next slide um is is an overview a helicopter view if you like these are the statistics i wanted to, i think you have to go through these um and I've picked kind of a, a, a few studies from the last few years just to hammer home the point that the newsroom and the industry, newsrooms and the industry in general are not diverse enough. The first one comes from a study by the women in journalism who do a lot of great work. Um, and it was, it's the most recent, so it's at the top. But basically, they looked at the bylines, bylines being the, basically someone's name in print aka this story was by Shingi Marike, this story was by X. They looked at the bylines in, in kind of all the major national newspapers um, and they found that not a single story by a black reporter appeared on the front page of a UK newspaper. Um, bear in mind this was still at the height of the BLM, BLM movement in the summer. Not a single one, zilch. And then of the 111 people quoted on the front pages, just one was a black woman. That black woman was Jen Reed, who, um, whose statue was basically, it was a story about the statue replacing the Colston statue in Bristol. And she was the lady who was pictured with her fist up in the air. Um, but I just find it, it was, it's also, you know, telling because in that period, COVID was, was rife in the black and ethnic minority community. So you could at least get an expert to talk about that. I would have thought of that first look, but no, you know, and it also, you know, the front page is a place that you give the most prominence in a paper, but the fact that there's not enough talent for one person to end up on the, on, on the front page, you know, of all those reporters and all, all those newspapers also says a lot. Um, another stat here is that just 0.2% of British journalists are black goes back to that point, you won't get a front page story by a black news reporter because there, there aren't really any. Our population, or the slice, our slice of the population is 3%, but only 0.2% get into journalism. That to me suggests there are systemic issues there. There are, you know, there are factors that play that mean you can't. Um, and the bottom stat, just to underscore the point, 43% of UK's most influ influential editors and broadcasters went to private school. That's a certain, those are certain trust figures. So what you have here, um, is a media landscape which is dominated by people who went to the same schools, who are of the same ethnic background, who are, you know, basically mates of mates often, not all the time, and there will always be outliers, but most of the time. But then what you also have, and there's a tension between the purpose of the media and the makeup of the media, because, uh, we, you know, any journalist, I think, would put public interest reporting and informing the public at the heart of what why they do it. But how can you inform the public if you you, you don't have a whole, you have a, basically, you have a, a massive blind spot um, or a few blind spots. You know, there are still issues around sexuality, race, whether it's black or wider ethnic minorities, um, gender as well to an extent. It's, you know, it's problematic. And the next slide, I think just to underscore that point, um, is this one. So it's a historic imbalance. These are out of, you know, over 200 years of, of, um, of, of British newspaper journalism, these are the only two non-white editors of, of any newspapers at all. So on your left is a man you probably recognise from BBC. He's a media correspondent now, um, or media editor, Amal Rajan, who edited The Independent from 2013 to 2016. The Independent's online only, but at that time it was still, it was still, um, still a print newspaper. And then the lady on the right, funny enough, a hundred years before, is um, Rachel Beer. And Rachel Beer was born in India, um, I think, to British Baghdadi Jews. Um, 
and then edited. She she kind of came back to Britain and edited uh, the Observer in in the late the Observer and the Sunday Times, in fact, in the late eighteen hundreds to sort of about nineteen hundred. Um, and a thing about Rachel Beer, she was largely not recognised. Her she only got a, a properly marked gravestone. Her grave had been dilapidated, left for years and years. But it's only recently a campaign by a lady called Anne Treneman, who's a who's a quite a prominent journalist, kind of brought to light that she was buried in a pretty anonymous grave in a, in a London cemetery, and she got given a proper tombstone to say this is the first female editor in Fleet Street, and you know, um, and I guess. The minority stuff hasn't been mentioned as much, and it's it's some people call Emil Rajan the first, the first black and ethnic minority editor. But point here is, this is it. That is it. So they're both Indian born. Uh, if we're taking it at, and this is Black History Month, so it's one of the reasons I'm doing it. But if we're taking it and looking at the black population, there are people who have got high, but again, anomalies, outliers. Gary Young, who's recently left, he was an, he's a fabulous journalist and writer. He was at The Guardian. He was editor at large until, I think, beginning of this year there. Darren Lewis is at The Mirror, and he's just been promoted to associate editor. Um, but then, and I think, you know, I, I, I think I know enough about newspapers. Um, but, I mean, I can't, I, I struggle to rack my brains to see anyone who's got there. So we don't just have problems with the numbers, as I mentioned in the last slide, but we have problems with retention. And these problems manifest themselves in just your coverage. Um, and, you know, there are a number of shortcomings we can see when we read or read newspapers or watch, you know, the mainstream television stations, some of which I've highlighted here. First of which is, we fail to forecast some of the big, the biggest stories if we don't have a diverse newsroom. Uh, the one that springs to mind is is Grenfell. That you know, Grenfell was inhabited by people who were of you know minority backgrounds and were poor, and the cladding issue had been knocking around for a few years before that. But who would have known? The newsrooms wouldn't have known because even if you're you know to steer and what you're looking at and the issues you're looking at, I think cladding on residential towers inhabited by working class people who are not why is pretty low down the list for obvious reasons because you are, you know, your newsroom and even the people who are from different backgrounds in your newsroom are programmed to write for your audience and to kind of, I guess, you know, in some ways write in a way that's influenced by just the circles you're moving. Um, and, you know, that was a huge miss. Now there are brilliant pieces of reporting, including Sunday Times are doing an amazing series at the minute. Lots of people have tapped into the issue, but we could have and we could have prevented it if we could have raised awareness around it beforehand, way beforehand, but it didn't happen. I think that's one of the consequences of, you know, just, just the paucity of diversity in the newsroom. Second thing is you miss out on a critical lens, meaning decision makers cannot be challenged. Um, first thing that sprung to mind sprung to mind when I thought about this was an Irish newspaper um, a couple of years ago mistook uh, Stormzy, the rapper for Romelu Lukaku, the Manchester United footballer both black bearded men of a certain stature. But if there was one black person in that newsroom or just someone who they could have called on in an advisory capacity, that wouldn't have happened. And it happens on a smaller scale too, whether it's linguistics or choice of images or, you know, just the optics. Having someone there who can stand up and say, this isn't on, yo, change it, or this is this is the wrong black person in that case. Um, is 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 pretty is pretty valuable, I think. And you know, I, I one of the things I enjoy about working where I work is, you know, if there's something, I'm encouraged to to speak up. Um, and I think you know, it's that that oftentimes there isn't even someone that you can find an artist to speak up. Um, because there's no one there. And then third point is you miss out on nuance and reporting on black issues, you know, just little cultural things you, that, you know, I don't know, take a hairstyle, how do you describe praise, cornrows, dreads, just little things like that. I think sometimes it's easier to understand if you're from that background, um, simply put. And, you know, in certain interviews, say if I interviewed, you know, a prominent black figure, and I shouldn't have to do that, I shouldn't be pigeonholed, but if I am, I know the texture of that interview, the things I pick up, the experiences, the sound bites we share are just going to be oftentimes a lot more powerful because we just have that kind of palatable shared area um, or shared interest. There was a guy I interviewed who set up a very recently who set up a kind of Netflix, a special Netflix collection of black content. And we were just talking about everything from him being a Nigerian to me being Zimbabwean to like, you know, just kind of similar trajectories. And it all weaved into quotes that I just were like, this is, you know, this is more human than it would have been if we had that barrier there. 
you know and sometimes you want to unpack an issue and give it that color that life that 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 fun or that that emotion sometimes having someone who, who shares the experiences with you will help not all the time but it does help and then the next point is you just miss out on the talent if you if you don't have a diverse newsroom you miss out on the talent pool that reflects the population and the credibility that comes with it people of certain backgrounds are less likely to read a paper if they don't see a single person single byline that sounds like one of their names or a single picture byline that looks like them just just it's just an obvious point and then you also lose new angles and takes on storytelling the thing that sprung to mind when i when i put this point down was just you know um i look at parliament and parliamentary reporting and it is you know to a degree a boys club is people who know each other and i've known each other from cambridge or oxford and then you know one of them went into the lobby one of them went into you know went into politics, went into the, the chamber down down in Parliament. And that, I guess, you know, them having shared ground, just like I mentioned, might help in interviews and there's that, there's lack of, there's, you know, you already made icebreaker. But sometimes you want someone who's from a completely different background, especially because politicians are the ones who are being, you, you need to hold accountable, you know, public money, public duty. Sometimes you need someone who's going to hold their feet to the fire and put to them issues that can only come from a minority background. One thing, I mean, it's slightly different point, but my local MP, Stephen Timms, again, just going back to what I mentioned about Newham, he, on a briefing call, I think it was a select committee, asked Boris Johnson uh, about no recourse to public funds, which is when people who are here, um, whether they're asylum seekers or, you know, um, they're in the country and are not documented yet, um, are not given kind of basic support. And Boris Johnson was like, what? That happens? You know, he was he was spinning. That's what you can do if you are coming at interviewing or chatting to someone or writing a story of a different background. You can hold them accountable and really thoroughly, you know, thoroughly put questions to them. And the last thing is just, uh, you know, it makes financial sense to have uh, a diverse newsroom because we're moving and shifting online. The people who buy newspapers are of a certain demographic, but the people who read things online are of a very different one. The Sunday Times recently and the Times have started looking at ways to go digital first. The digital native is a very different demographic um, and much, you know, much more diverse than your, you know, than than your paper reader. So I think a lot of papers are cottoned onto this, but it it you know it you will lose money if you do not start appealing to a broader audience um and the way you can appeal to a broader audience is by having a newsroom which is a collection of experiences that was the negative portion of what i wanted to say um now i want to move into the slightly more pragmatic portion which um i guess started i mean i think i can't talk about it without starting at the flashpoint this summer um and you know what happened um, across the world, really, following the death of George Floyd. And this image, there were lots of images I could have chosen from the Black Lives Matter protests across the UK, but I picked this one of John Baega because I just thought it spoke to how visceral some of us felt about what had happened to George Floyd, but also about the discussions that we were having, whether it's me talking about spinach or you know, whatever else it may be. But the discussions that we were having took a toll and were tiresome, but also they felt like a massive moment of catharsis is what I'm looking, the word I'm looking for. A breakthrough, a point to say enough is enough. Let's examine the institutions that, you know, are that are holding this country up, whether it's parliament where black MPs are mixed up for black MPs and the regular or called cleaners, whether it's, you know, the, the classroom where the curriculum is, you know, is skewed in a certain way that ignores some of the greatest injustices you can imagine perpetrated by the British Empire, or you know, just in newsrooms um, where I am, where it's like, like, hold on, we got one, you know, one reporter from, you know, one black reporter or one reporter from this subsection of the population, but this is a huge issue. You know, we were forced to examine ourselves um, and do that in a way that. Um, that I guess, you know, led to somewhat a, a breakthrough, if you like, a discursive breakthrough so far, I'd say. Um, and, you know, after George Floyd, a couple of things happened, but the discussion broadened around race and, and the media, for one, which I work in. And I remember the McTaggart lecture at Edinburgh TV Festival given by um, David Alasuga, the historian and documentary maker. And he spoke so openly about how, you know, so many people, he started with on TV, who were black and from similar backgrounds, and just dropped out. They gave up because it was just too hard. The, the, you know, the discrimination was too much. 
the, the just the lack of support and the lack of money behind the ideas was too much. And, you know, a couple of years ago, that would have rung on their fears, but people start taking notice. Even, you know, where I work, News UK have come up with a, with a kind of a diversity and inclusion strategy, which is by all accounts pretty radical and will, will hopefully shake up the whole business, you know. Um, so the door is starting to open. Things are starting to shift. Um, and I... I am not an executive, so I cannot come at it from a lens whereby I'm talking numbers and figures and that sort of thing. But what I can say is that with things shifting, now is a good moment for any, not just a black person, but for, for you know, someone from a unique and slightly different background uh, looking to get into media. Now is a moment for you to try and kick the door down and you know, be really pragmatic about how you get in because your voice for the for one of you know maybe for the first time in a sustained way your voice is being looked at by executives and people who run these places as super necessary like we need x we need z we need to be more on the ball when it comes to you know just understanding the population and representing them better and i just thought you know as i begin to wrap up that i'll share the kind of tips um and tools of the trade that may help someone who's trying to get into a job like mine or a different job in the media because i feel like now more than ever is a chance to you know, just give it a good go um i may be wrong i hope i'm not um but you know we go in with optimism and we go, and, and i wanted to kind of leave with some practical pointers on the next slide which is titled how to break the door down further um, I'm really stretching this metaphor to its limits, but this is, it is what it is. Um, so my first tip would be find a mentor, but I caveat that, find a mentor that gets you, that understands you. So uh, to take it back in the talk, I spoke about those young journalism programs that I did um, and those sort of, those, those diversity schemes. The lady called Viv Regan, who run both of those schemes, was my kind of champion at the beginning. And she understood the media as well as anyone but she also had no kind of and she wouldn't mind me saying it no airs and graces about the fact that um you know this is a certain establishment you've got to kick the door down and do yourself and you as in you know you do you and just you know the establishment is cool but your your fresh ideas and your new ideas are more important and she's always she's always been you know an advocate for doing things in a way that shakes the tree up a little rather than just landing in the newsroom and then just come in another shiny suit guy you know and that is important and a few of the other people have helped me in different in different elements and aspects again I feel like they understand my principles and the kind of journalist I want to be um and that is just so helpful to have advice from someone who's, who's a bit further along but you want advice that you know you actually feel like you can implement um and you actually feel like you can use I'm very well looked after here um and you know that is always helped you know people have always just on a base level aside from you know race background they've always said this is Shingi's story how do we improve it how do we improve him I was sent to Scotland for six months I was given you know I'm given copious tips on how to improve still that's important so mentors are key second thing is bring yourself and bring your experiences to the table um I think when my boss looks out into the newsroom uh which is obviously behind me uh didn't do that on purpose, I promise. He, she will see a kind of collection of experiences and ideas. That is why, and now, when we're trying to represent the population better and trying to understand the fact that newspapers should be a true broad church, that is very important. So I feel like, you know, if your workplace can't take you as you are, whether it's you're someone with dreadlocks from X or you're someone with Z from Y, then it's, it's a problem and then also it's a richer product if certain people stand up and bring not just stuff related to race but maybe what you saw at your uni what you saw on the street what you saw where you live bring those to the newsroom you know don't just come in as an automaton uh, be yourself and bring those experiences to ideas meetings consistently because you may be surprised that thing you heard about acid attacks you might be able to stand up and then the third thing is build a support system because self-preservation is key it's a taxing industry it's tiresome it's hard work you know um there are lots of late nights um and you know you have to have a kind of resilience so having people around you who you know care can encourage you to eat that dinner when you weren't going to eat it can you know take you to task about things that don't just have to be related to work is key i've got loads i've got some some friends who are like people i met at journalism school who i go for drinks with and we just talk about the industry i have you know my family my mom my brother i have you know you know loads of people but the, the point is you shouldn't you know 
you shouldn't isolate yourself. You should you should look to you should look to people um, and just you know do things that you enjoy um, in and around the work because otherwise you will lose it. Today I went swimming before this talk because I was like, what do I do to center myself? I exercise. Like there should be some non-negotiable sometimes so that you have a life. A journalist with a life is better than one without one. A journalist who has you know well basically someone who feels a bit better and is a bit more balanced is probably more useful and then um another thing is read widely and consistently that means reading lots of papers whether it's local newspapers international newspapers books um you know uh, websites blogs but just your, your your armory and the things that you pitch are just so based on your knowledge of certain issues and trying to find things and issues you can develop that 15 word story in the sun or 15 word story in x newspaper might be something that you could develop from the sunday times you never know you just have to read and then the last thing and i think the most important thing is yes i've hopped on for about 30 minutes about being a dad you know being a black person in the newsroom and being a minority in the newsroom but if you want to do well, my base level thing is I want to be a great journalist, period. I do not want to be a great black journalist. And that's where this last point comes in. Show them your range, you know, show them that you can go high and low. Show them that you can report on that really grim thing if you need to, because it was the breaking news item. But also show them you can do fun stuff. I've done all kinds of like mischief, counted genitalia in art galleries, and that got a lot of place in the newspaper done same-sex dance classes, meditated with horses, gone swimming um, when swimming pools are allowed to reopen. I wasn't so keen about getting my, my top off for a newspaper picture, but you, you, the line of duty calls, you do it. But what I'm trying to say is, you know, understand your product. And a lot of these establishment news brands are a poor church and, that, you know, the population is vast and varied. So you have to find ways to just make sure your journalism has no blank spots. So I'm reading uh, Trevor, Trevor McDonald's um, autobiography at the minute, the great ITN newscaster, and he cut his teeth doing it all, politics, death knocks, royal stories. Then he got onto the TV, TV as the kind of, well, News at 10 as, you know, the first black newsreader. But he learned his craft. No matter what you're, you know, no matter where you're coming from, the craft is as important because like, I just feel you're, you're doing your, your minority background a disservice if you can't do the job. Um, so that, those are my kind of pointers, if you like. And on a final note, I just wanted to say, um, like, I'm, I'm not just being optimistic because I wanted to, you know, find it for this talk. Um, I'm being optimistic because I think things can shift. Um, but it just takes people to kind of, you know, look at some of those stats I spoke about earlier and look into your anchors and your background and be like, okay, I'm bringing this to the table with me because if I don't, then we're just going to go back into the, the same cycle, um, protests or not. Um, but, you know, in in a nutshell, newspaper journalism is a brilliant business. I, I still a highly influential business, as is the, the rest of the media industry. Um, but, you know, we need more people who are of, of, of backgrounds uh, different to what we're used to to make it work. Uh, that was my sort of... Uh, my my battle cry if you like uh and uh i'll leave the floor open to questions so if i didn't ramble too much thank you that was that was so interesting and um so many things have come to mind i'm gonna i'm gonna leave the floor open to questions uh just a couple of couple from me first of all where can we find that picture of you without your top on for the <laughs> that, yeah, that's that one's that's in that, that. <laughs> I can't tell you. <laughs> if um, you look hard enough, you'll find it, but it's a, it's a <laughs> dangerous line of questioning that, Jimmy. <laughs> Listen, um, that was so interesting. And, and I think you said about halfway through that we don't want to hear any more about you, but actually listening to you and your story was, it was not just interesting. I think it was inspiring. It would be inspiring to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I like hearing about you and I like hearing about your story. And, and I think your story should be should be used and you should be um you should be kind of heard in schools and stuff. I think like we're gonna promote this across high schools across the southwest. And I think your story will res res resonate with so many people. Um and actually we contacted you because you were named as one of the kind of uh best up and coming journalists in, in the country. That uh, uh, so that was really cool. So just putting those things in context, um, I shall um, hand over to Antigone uh, 
you have a question. Yes, uh, I really like how you said that, you know, you don't want to be a great black journalist, but you want to be a great journalist. So my question is, how do you manage to um, kind of avoid being, you know, that token black person in the room and like kind of having to take on all those, you know, issues and stuff and, you know, doing your thing while also kind of empowering, you know, other people of the same background and yeah, how, how do you manage that? I think a key thing is taking the time to process, if you like. So taking the time to be like, if you're given a job or, or asked some, to do something, taking the time to assess it and be like, is this going to pigeonhole me? Is this problematic? Could someone else do it? Um, or, you know, on the flip side, can I advance the cause if I write about X? So when I wrote that personal piece over the summer, it was like, I could have said no, but I thought at this moment, it's the good one to do. But on the flip side, as I said, assess every every chance you're, you know, or every kind of thing you're given if you can. Um, and I'm very lucky here in the sense that um, I'm frequently reminded that I don't have to feel like I only have to do the black stories. Um, it's not that useful to me and it's not that useful to them. So um, I'm encouraged to speak out and it can be nerve wracking to say, oh, I don't want to do X or I feel like it's getting a bit too in this territory. But, but I think, no, you can't. Do it on your own terms. Um, that's my my advice. But then also just assess each each kind of commission as it comes. Great, thank you. And thanks for the talk, it was great. <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you for the question. Are there any others? Jacob, you can walk up. Yeah, is that all, yeah, is that all right if I jump in? Um, yeah, Hi, it's great. It's great to listen to you. It's yeah, as what Jermaine said was just like spot on. So many people, I think a lot of people who will listen to this are just going to relate to everything that's just been said completely. And um, and just when you went over the statistics about like um, representation, um, do you think there's a place in the market for a more, or if there is any, I don't know, black-owned newspaper companies or news outlets? There are a few really interesting ones already. So Black Ballad, Gaudem, and more kind of heritage black news outlets like The Voice. So there could be space for it, but I also think promoting what's there and people, you know, I think when you come into the industry, you have a choice. I went, you know, mainstream and I'm here at, at this publication, but, you know, those are really vaunted and powerful voices. Um, and, you know, if someone wants to be a journalist, they shouldn't ignore them. There might be space for more, but I think what's there is great too. That's that's my answer in a nutshell. If you wanted to start yeah. a thing, good, but I don't think you should ever feel under pressure to start a thing when you know there's an existing apparatus. For sure, for sure. Cheers. All right. So, um, growing up in London, Shingi, uh, growing up in Newham, in fact, so in a really poor borough, what effect did that have on you and like your work ethic as a, as, a, as a person growing up and as a young young man? Yeah. Uh, I think you just learn to grind, really, because it's, you know, it, as cliche as it sounds, you get, you often get two paths, you know, this is that simple in a, in a bar of a profile like New York, particularly if you're from, you know, single parent home where only one parent's around, so that super, super vibe, that guiding hand isn't there all the time, uh, but I remember it's slightly off off topic, but I remember a guy I sat behind in my my form class when I got to year seven. He, you know, since since I sat behind him, has been in prison twice. Uh, one of which was a crime I won't even mention, and the other was running kids down from London to Exeter. So he's from a single parent home, just like me. You know, I guess I had I was lucky in the sense that my mum was so on it, but you know. Your material circumstance, my, my point is you get choices and you need to make the right ones if you can. Um, sometimes it's out of your control, the choice is made for you. But the second thing is your material circumstances definitely, and I think working class people from London to Glasgow to, you know, anywhere, you know, Dublin, wherever it may be, can uh, relate to this. But I think, you know, your material circumstances make you want to work um, really hard. It can be tiresome, but, you know, I guess you want to make something of yourself. Um, and, you know, getting into newspapers, I often feel like, you know, yes, I'm a journalist, I'm a news reporter, but some of the things I've carried with me and some of the things that well, what I even represent means it's it's a bit more important. It's important to me, basically, a bit, maybe even a bit more important to try and pave the way and to really, you know, make inroads. But yeah, I think a lot of working class uh, people from working class background will have the exact same drive and, and it's it's so interesting so another question related to what 
one of the one of the first things she said. So I think it's fair to say that with your acid attack story mm. and, and the resultant campaign, you literally change government policy. Mm. Is that the ultimate power of journalism? Is that one of the things that you want to get out of your work? I think so. I think so. And my only slight disappointment to this point is I haven't done it more often. I need to hurry up. Uh, get another, I was hilarious. I was like 20 and that is like still my biggest scoop. But anyway, um, yeah, that is, you know, from you, 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 it's one of those professions that is very easy to, to kind of, I guess, fable and glamorize because you just think about, you know, Bob Woodward and, and, and Bernstein breaking Watergate and, you know, bringing down Nixon or, you know, on smaller scales, like, the Daily Mail, who are often maligned, campaigned so hard on behalf of um, Stephen Lawrence's family um, and helped change things. I mean, so yeah, you know, you can you can you can shift you can shift the narrative and shift law in journalism, which is why I implore people from different backgrounds to get into it because then we can be shifted different laws, not just the ones that affect certain people. Yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm still I'm still. Um, uh, just in awe of what you've done in what four years, five years in journalism. I'm in a hurry, man. I'm in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, relate coming back to to the story that the the one that you referred to um, mm. when you were stopped and searched over spinach from ASDA. Yeah. Tell us. I, I don't want you necessarily to tell us about your pain and your experience because I think black people are asked to do that all the time. So that's not necessarily what we're what we're after here. But what are your thoughts of policing and the justice system after your experience? Yeah, yeah. I think before the experience, I had thoughts on it that I guess crystallised from what your I talked about in my piece and in this discussion I did today. The talk that your parents give you about you know how the justice system, at least statistically, um, is skewed or you know skewed against uh, black people. There are loads of Ministry of Justice figures, the Lamy report as well, that just touch on how different facets of the legal system, uh, you know, if you're more likely to be incarcerated, more likely to see force when you're arrested. You think about the McPherson report and the fact that the findings that the Met Police was institutionally racist and that hampered Steve, the inquiry into Stephen Lawrence's death. All those things, I, you know, as I, can, I cannot, you know, when I'm writing about race um and particularly racism in britain i can't ignore you know just the context you're in so i think the spinach thing uh which was a good way into the story to kind of give our readers the oh my gosh was like also a good way for me to explore the wider issues which i think you know are still there's still a ten you, you you and most people from my background know that there's a tension between you know working class black Britons and the authorities in some way um and you know it's 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 a big one to explore it's it's deep but you know I definitely think you know whether it's systemic issues that mean we're more likely to end up on the wrong side of the law or systemic issues the other way in certain forces whatever um there's just a, a long way to go I hope I can improve I have a discussions but yeah that's my in a nutshell those are my thoughts on it yeah, and it's it's kind of everywhere, isn't it? It's like yeah. uh, how we're more likely, black people are more likely to be incarcerated for the same crimes, more likely mm. to be placed in care, more likely to be expelled from school, like, and then the health stuff as well. But anyway, um, Jacob. Yeah, um, so how, I'm just wondering, how important do you think uh, uh, black British history is, how important is it to be taught into schools and across all across all levels, I guess, as well? as far as like, I don't know, primary school all the way up to university level. And do you think like campaigns like the Black Curriculum and Teach Black History 365 could be successful in this country? Yeah, I think, funnily enough, on the topic of campaigns, I wrote about one, um, a black kind of a black schools or black history campaign, uh, which is called 100 black, Great Black Britons. Uh, there's a book that's recently come out written by a guy called Patrick Vernon, who's on an OBE for his services to kind of Black Britain, Windrush Generation. And his campaign was basically um, similar to... I, I, the two you mentioned, I'm not aware of, but I'm sure in principle they're similar in the sense that he went into schools, taught black history and encouraged students to put forward ideas and, and, and you know, um, and presentations and talks. Um, 
about black figures, Mary Seiko ended up getting recognised a hell of a lot more after his campaign. Um, and the short answer is yes, it's extremely important um, because when we have, you know, what happened this summer, we can context better contextualise those issues and those injustices that we're talking about if we look at black British history because it's way more nuanced than just ripping off, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King quotes and, and, and looking at that stuff when there was a bus boycott in Bristol too in a sim around a similar time, you know, there were there were there was a colour bar in Britain too around a similar time. So the answer is a million percent. Yes, we should. We absolutely should. It just gives you a more nuanced take and a more well informed take on some of the issues here. Um and I just just a lot more useful for people to know, British kids to know anyway. For sure, thank you. Yeah, definitely. No, no worries. So we run out of questions. No, no my, my internet went down for a second, so uh, apologies. No worries. Sorry, Can you guys hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Have we lost your main? Can you hear me? Let me come back. Yeah, I can. I think I can hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. My yeah, my internet's gone real funny. So apologies. Um, Shingi, what uh, what does it mean to be black in the UK today to you? Uh, I think it means to be at a crossroads, which I hope is a turning point at a basic level. You know. The discussions we've been having in the last few months um, and the way we've banded together um, has made me incredible. I was always proud to be black, but made me even more proud. Um, but I'm also now aware of, you know, trying to be pragmatic, whether it's, you know, in whether in the workplace and the stuff you do and the people you assist or, you know, just uh, on a on a day to day basis too. It's like this is this is this has always been. I've always, I've, you know, it's always been a great joy to be where I'm from. Uh, but now it's like the systemic barriers that have sometimes made things hot. Do we have a chance to try and boot some of those down? Um, so I'm, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic. That's how I feel about being back right now. But generally speaking, you know, greatly proud. I'm proud of my Zimbabwean heritage and the kind of people we are um, and the kind of lessons that my mom taught me too. Tell, tell me about well, I, I, I probably had the same the same talk with, with my grandparents. But tell me about that talk. What what is that talk that your mom had with you? Yeah. Um. So I mean, the first time I had it, I mentioned it. The, the piece uh, always comes back to spinach. Uh. Basically, <laughs> she. Um. I went to like nursery after the first time I'd been with other kids. You know, well, lots of other kids. You know, class of fifteen, twenty odd, or whatever. Um. And I think someone else must have pointed out because at that time. New York has changed rapidly, but at that time there was it was still it still it was not as diverse as it is now. But anyway, I mean one of the kids, not you know, not at Madison, sort of, but just kind of pointed to me and said that you're you're different. They might have said you're black, but I don't know. But they basically pointed at my skin and said yours is different to the rest of us here. So then I went home and said to my mum, oh, I'm blue, I'm blue. And she was like, What what do you mean blue? I've kind of meant that, you know, I'm well, it was me basically alluding to the fact that I was, I was black. So that was the first time race was mentioned. Then on the talk, the kind of prep my mum is, you don't just get a talk, you get like version 1, 1A, 1B, 2C, subsection 4, subclause 8. Um, but it was just kind of consistently, kind of consistent reminders about, you know, how well I need to do in education, the, the numbers of people in positions like I am now, I went to Russell Group Uni, the numbers of black students that were there, um, how to approach the group justice system the police you know literally the talk would be you know there'll be a different topic each time but it was kind of all part of a and it was never to it was never you know i think one of the issues we get here now is people almost feel like people are victimizing themselves it's, it was never to victimize me it was basically to make me aware to make me streetwise it was never like okay so now you should be upset about the way the world is moving it's like get your ass up and do the work because and, and be be aware because you know this might not be as easy for you as it is for another person point blank that and that's my approach to it too yes thank you meg 
Hi, yeah. And first of all, thanks because this has been so interesting. Um, and I echo everything Jermaine and everyone said. Um, you yeah. spoke a little about um, in your talk. You spoke spoke a bit about um, after graduating having a bit of a slump. Totally understand that. Um, do you have any tips? For graduates, particularly younger black graduates, um, into getting into, into the in media industry or yeah, um, yeah. like their first kind of steps. I have tips for everyone, man. Um, but um, I think you know, I think me, yeah. Firstly, on the slump question, yeah, I saw you you give the vigorous head nods, so I was like, oh man, don't worry, I sympathise with you. Um, so that I think just you know, it, it's it's a symptom of growing up, and it and it is what it is. And then you like you have your uni experience, and like I need to be be someone or do something. But I think life moves fast. Um, but again, again, having that support system and friends who I could talk to, and my family helped, um, and just trying to look after myself, um, even through difficulties and a time like this that rings even true. Like that's important. Then on the second part of the question about getting into. Uh, a media career I think the central tenets will always remain the same you need to you know you need to try and build up a brand um kind of that term sometimes makes you want to vomit but it is it is a fact you need to figure out what your interests are what kind of journalism you want to do then reach out to people in that area journalists are often happy or able to help and then also maybe build up a thing a portfolio whether it's a blog or you know a medium or you know a youtube channel whatever kind of journalism you're interested in but just start building because any employer a uh, prospective media employer wants you want to see what you have so you need to be able to show and prove you know what you've done um so having a portfolio is really useful as well as kind of making contact with people whether it's kind of smaller scale publications and magazines and because the internship route is difficult if you're outside of london and you're not you know i was so lucky that the internships here were unpaid but i was getting to work in 30 minutes um because i live in east london and this is kind of you know central but well connected but the internship route is difficult um, and somewhat out of your control but the two other things I mentioned the portfolio and just reaching out to people asking can I write for you or can I get my work published um, those two things are in your control so I think it's just trying to create a steady output trying to understand what kind of journalism you want to do don't pigeonhole yourself and don't you know say okay I'm not going to do x because I've said I'm going to be a music and culture journalist but you know um just having a roadmap in your mind is really helpful. And also a lot, another thing is like the key in journalism, particularly in my kind of journalism, which is news reporting for the most part, is a contacts book. You can, anyone can build up a contacts book, like the local shopkeeper, the guy in the corner, the whoever, those are, you know, talk to people, figure out what the real life issues are, you know, figure out what they're about, what they can tell you, because that's how you, you start, you know. You build up sources without even knowing, and my best sources don't even know when they've given me like a, a, an exclusive. They'll just be talking, talking, and then they'll be like, "You know what you just said is wild," like you know. But again, it's just I wouldn't have been able to get X story if I hadn't have had contacts. Um, so yeah, building that up is important. Basically, in a nutshell, treat yourself like a journalist, even if you haven't got a single published piece of work, because that is just the way to get the wheel, the, the ball rolling, if you like. Great, thank you. No worries. Um, Shingi, we've been an, at just over an hour now, and that's one of the quickest hours I've uh, ever had. It, oh, um, it, it, do you know what? I think um, what kind of exemplifies how interesting and inspiring your talk has been is that Naomi Private messaged me a minute ago saying, I will read it directly. Um, what an inspirational speaker. Oh, thank you so much. No, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Naomi. You also got a really nice conservatory. Um, <laughs> as, I'm gonna, as I'm gonna say, really quickly, um, the only thing is, because I had my slide up, so I don't know when you put it up on YouTube whether you'll be able to see my face. I don't know if that's a problem. I'll, I'll work something out, man. We'll, we'll chat afterwards and, and I can sort that out. All right, no worries. But I, I really enjoyed it and I thought the questions were great too. And like, I don't know if you guys want to be journalists or not, but I hope you know, what I said was somewhat useful because I think the, the stuff about breaking into a workplace to some to some degree will always cross over. Um, and we're in like, you know, strange and difficult times for any young person, like, and it's hard. But I honestly think the things that have kept me going is just knowing that these are my basics, you know, on a crap day, I know I'm from X and I want to do Z. These are my goals. Um, and then I just 
sometimes, you know, some days you can't force yourself to get up, but sometimes that will just get me through and then, you know, the rest happens as it happens. Listen, thank you for your time, my friend. My pleasure. Uh,